A game is very much like the human ecosystem. Some people get obsessed with the outside beauty, aka the graphics, even if the game has the depth of a kiddie pool. Some games may focus on the strategy that comes from complex interactions in the brain, or may be injected with life through the lungs of its story. But all games also have a skeleton, a core system that drives and moves the game from one place to another. And while you don't need to think about what the pancreas of this analogy is, skeletons are at the heart of this week's review. Also witch cats and mushrooms that radiate radio waves. Yeah, this analogy has gone out the window. Osteoblast releases today on February 12th, 2021 for $7.99 on the PC and is by the developer Munana, best known for Virgo vs. the Zodiac. You don't know what Virgo vs. the Zodiac is? Well, if some dumbass would finally get a review of that game going, you'd know that it was my best game of 2019 and the most overlooked game of 2019, and is in my Elite Hall of Fame games that I will gush about with Wondersong, Valhalla, and Danganronpa. However, it should be noted that Osteoblasts is majorly developed by only a portion of the team here, specifically by Anglerman, who's known for the animations in the other games. Granted, Nana and Electro Bear are also involved in the game in a lesser part, but this is Anglerman's game through and through. But before I begin, this key was obtained from the developer, Munana, for the purposes of review. That won't change my opinion of the game in the end, but you should know that because of FTC guidelines, as well as the whole morals thing, you know? So, Osteoblast has you wake up as a skeleton with a small backstory based on one of the six classes that you can choose. These choices provide a basic structure for your character's reason for going on an adventure, as well as basic starting stat advantages that play to specific strategies. For example, the scavenger is a treasure hunter that loves to use texts and curses, relying mainly on speed to do a lot of what it wants to do, and he's probably wanting to find that next score. Meanwhile, the Savage loves using offensive tech and weapons, focusing mainly on strength and a little on survivability. And, well, he loves his violence, and any excuse to, you know, attack things is going to be up his alley. There's also classes of the Samurai, the Scientist, and the Stranger, but I won't go over them all in detail here. Finally, there's a class that I chose to play the game with, the Shaman. The one who hears voices calling, but not where they're from. She benefits from using blessings and attacks with blasts, wanting to worship the owl and spider goddesses. I found that she does like to focus on defense and spite more than physical attributes, but that sort of leads me to my overall impression of the different classes. See, they provide templates to start your character out, but frankly, that's what they are. Templates and you can choose to adjust them as you play along. See, with weapons and armor and accessories determining what skills you have and use, there's no reason you can't run a shaman that was physically imbued, or a savage who has a little bit of spite in them. In fact, I would very much encourage it. Part of this combat's major strength is the flexibility of playing around with different loadouts, seeing what works, what doesn't, and just trying new shit because there's a lot here to work with. Which of course, leads me to start this review by focusing on this game's combat. The game on the surface is a typical turn-based affair, with each side using a series of stats to determine a variety of things. There are six main stats in the Osteoblasts, Strength, Skill, Soul, Spite, Speed, and Survival, and yes, they all start with S. Now at first, these stats may seem to mirror stats of other games' elements, and to a certain extent they do. Strength focuses on physical strength moves like smacking someone with a sword and deals with attack damage and attack resistance. Survival is an indication of how you recover HP through items and blessings, however, so it's not exactly a defense or a recovery stat, but it's similar. Now you can see what each stat does on the screen here, 
but that's only the strict definition of the stat. See, each move that you have tells you what stat it uses and what stat it may boost or may bring down. Sometimes two stats may play into the strength of a move. Sometimes it increases the stat overall a couple of turns. I mean, the thing is, is that if you don't like reading and understanding what moves do and just like smacking things in an RPG, you're probably not going to like this game because many of these moves have secondary effects as well, such as healing you over turns or even stunning an enemy. You, heck, you may not know exactly what it does to begin with and only learn it when actually using it. Bone steel? Okay, yeah, I could figure that out. That's probably a life steal. Noise? Um, okay, it seems to be an elemental type attack that somebody can have resistance to. Bone break? Actually, I still don't know what that one does. Huh. What's different about this combat system is the stat of marrow. Consider marrow being action points of sorts. Most moves take a certain amount of marrow to perform, even the most basic of attacks, such as biting an enemy or just spooking them. Now you do have defensive type moves that can regain marrow, or you could simply wait and recover a couple during a turn. But really, it's all about managing your marrow to use a series of moves without really ever having to play a strict waiting game. And well, the game does this really, really, really well. Combat is intelligent with having to consider your opponent's strengths and constructing a loadout that not only takes advantage of your strengths, but allows you flexibility to use non-ideal moves for enemies that may have the right type of resistances. Even simple one-on-one -on -one battles in the new areas can be trouble if you don't pay attention to things like the colored outline of an enemy, which indicates the enemy's biggest strength and how to deal with them in a broad sense. This is especially true with the emphasis of counters and defense, which shouldn't be a surprise for those who loved Virgo vs the Zodiac. That was a big system there. However, in Osteoblasts, counters are usually automatic for the most part when being attacked, hitting back with a reasonable amount of force. Defense, especially tied in with saving action points for Marrow, can be a very viable strategy here, just as long as you got some good survival to heal up when you're pushed to the brink, or face an enemy that can take advantage of a particular weakness. Now, you can grind to help yourself out if you're running into trouble, and let me be clear, I did die several times in this game, and in every area, but it's definitely not necessary, especially if you plan ahead. In fact, even grinding a little bit won't help if you're stubborn and try to use tactics that don't fit the enemies that you're trying to take down, which honestly is a breath of fresh air. Certain times in certain games, especially in RPGs, the ability to reuse things over and over again and reuse strategies over and over again starts to make the game feel, you know, stale. Here, it's not the case. Things like this disruption of magic user skill, it's the perfect tool for this specific enemy, and not having it along when you're facing tons of them in a row, <laughs> a really bad idea. Which means that you always need to be looking at your equipment and changing out appropriate loadouts. Hell, even weapons early in the game can be useful if you have the right need for them, although there is some randomization involved with the blessings. But the stats, the pure stats, doesn't really change over the course of the game. Yeah, you may find a better weapon for what you need right now, but it's not like you want to necessarily get rid of that other weapon. If you are someone who loves to experiment with loadouts, even when you find one that works well for you, then you'll find that Osteoblasts is the kind of game you'll get lost in. That, however, is one of the things I want to highlight about Osteoblasts. It's a game that definitely can be very polarizing in its design, which is great that it has a demo, but here's the thing, you may not see some of those elements until 10-15 hours in. Take the actual game's main story quest and the direction that it gives you, or in particular, how it gives it to you. If you're expecting the game to give you a quest log and a compass of where to go, <laughs> you're shit out of luck here, you're not gonna get that. 
You're going to need to listen to every NPC and talk to them, especially after the big story events, to figure out exactly where to go next. I mean, this is an adventure. You may even need to keep your own personal quest log of things to do in, you know, that whole writing thing, you know, notes back in the old NES days. This is especially true if you play the game on and off like I did, and you have absolutely no idea at times what you're supposed to do because you weren't entirely paying attention. You'll just wander around the world hoping to find a section that you don't recognize, and that you have the right key or item in order to find it. I spent a lot of time running around trying to figure out exactly what to do next, and sure, the game has a map, but it's basically a general idea of, oh, I think I need to go that way because they mentioned a waterfall. Is that a waterfall? Oh god, I don't know. With some of the items that you need at certain points, especially keys, not having an idea of what to do next can lead you to really question whether or not age and your memory is catching up to you. Yeah, that's a different style of gameplay and it works for some and not for others. However, there are some general things that I didn't like about the overall progression here. It doesn't help that sometimes, typical traits regarding JRPGs aren't used when it comes to the game's map design. Some of you may wonder why many of the old games in the JRPG genre had long roads at the end of a screen. Well, that's because it naturally guides the player to the spot that changes screens at. You're funneled into it. Sometimes, Osteoblast has exits that are one or two tiles, which sometimes are exits, but sometimes they're not, and so you're going to have to keep on trying all these places, and you may forget which ones you've already tried. This leads to natural frustration when you end up running around and can't find that one exit, the one exit you truly need to move on to the next map. which. In this case, you may assume that I have a problem with the game's presentation and how it prevents information such as the map. And while there are definitely specialized cases that I'm not a fan of, this is definitely not the overall case. Battles in particular have life to them, especially with your weaponry. It's clear that Anglerman played to his animation strengths here, as even the simple attacks with different weaponry are all animated individually here beautifully, giving an impact to a lot of the game's battles. You use a sword, you're gonna get a sword animation. You use a mace, you're gonna get a mace animation. So on and so forth, and it's not generic. The creature and character designs, while sort of all over the place, range from cute to what the hell is that, and do feel like of the same world. It really does also a great job of giving tiny characterization elements to really give you an idea of what they are like on the surface without giving you too much detail. Granted, the game's focus on two or three colors at a time with characters does have its drawbacks. You may sit here and wonder what a certain body part or element is when staring at a model for a long time, and there were a couple of cases that I just sat there going, I'm missing something here. The art style in a whole isn't bad, mind you, and gives the game a general spooky feel to it for the most part. But if you're once again expecting some of the vibrance of Virgo vs. the Zodiac, you're not going to get it here. Because well, it's not part of the overall themes, but at times I was wishing for that. Sound design in general is pretty good, you hear the effects of weapons hitting things, and it does have interesting sound effects in terms of some of the wackier things that happen in the game that really fit the situation. But of course, I do need to talk about Electro Bear and his music, and look, I love the music in Virgo vs. the Zodiac, and that was by Electro Bear. Electro Bear, I'm not sure if he's capable of producing bad music, and the fact is, is that the music here not only fits the situation and the battle themes that you really want, but it's something that's really, really addicting over time. Just take a listen and hear what I'm talking about here.
Now, in terms of bugs and performance, performance wasn't an issue. The fact is, this is a JRPG or a turn-based RPG. That's not going to be an issue in most cases, and I didn't run into any problems. Bugs? For the most part, they weren't there. I did run into an occasional tile that I could walk onto that I really shouldn't have been able to, but I was able to walk off of it with no problems. There was only one big problem that happened, and it had to do with a sequence where you're sort of in a, like a mindscape, sort of in your own mind, and it's supposed to be sort of that, you know, twisted environment that could change at any point. Well, I ended up touching the skull, and, well, got stuck. Literally, I couldn't get out of the area that it put me in. Now, I will say that the developer did fix this when I brought it to their attention and the bug was fixed in a relatively short amount of time. So, I will give them that. But if you run into an issue like this, well, you're probably going to need to talk to them because unless if you were scum saving or saving, you know, really a lot like I was, you probably would be... Well, you'd probably throw the game out the window at that point because you would be losing 8 to 10 hours of progress, or something along that line. So, you're probably going, Hey Dragnix, this is an RPG, and you're this far into the review and you've only basically touched on the story. It's gotta be a negative, right? You didn't even do your structure thing from the past. And no, I'm not gonna continue that. Now, I'm here to say that no, that's not the case with this story entirely. But I'm also not going to say that those looking for the next beauty of a story from Virgo vs. the Zodiac team are going to get what they want in Osteoblast. In fact, part of the reason I struggled with this review so much was the story section of it, because quite frankly, and I'm gonna be a little bit, you know, behind the scenes here, I got lost with it. To say that my experimentation in this review with limited note taking really came into play this time around would be an understatement. Remember kids, evolving your review style means that you have to be willing to fail at times at certain points and it's good to let your audience know that because yes, in the story element of this, it will be worth following other reviewers to get an idea of what they thought about the story because I will admit, I think I had troubles with it. Now, there are glimpses of the really clever pun and joke writing that was in Virgo, and you can tell that the writers behind the game wanted to have fun with the theme, but in particular wanted to keep to that theme. Jokes about bones and marrow and being dead, they can be clever at times here and get a good laugh, and overall, a lot of the sub-dialogue does bring a smile to my face. Expectations are played with here well in terms of setting up ridiculous scenarios and sort of leave you going, wait, did that just happen? What just happened? What is this world? The world itself and its division of areas such as the bog and the farming town of, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what these things are, do a great job of making the world feel lived in and still connected to the quests and troubles that you'll go through. In particular, when the game hits and using that to connect to the main skeleton's story and what he was tasked to do by the Witch Cat, it can feel like a suitable epic of sorts. But note how I said, when the game does. The story suffers from connecting with the main character, probably due to the structure of being one of six classes, and you trying to fit yourself into the mold of this character. Given my shaman character, I felt like her reactions to certain story elements and how she answered certain challenges felt way too generic. It didn't really play at times to the whole voices in her head that was led in in the selection of the class, and thus I started to really not feel like I was a shaman, but more that I was just a skeleton, and that did make the game suffer. It definitely felt like the game was relying on me to make up some of the story and backstory in my head. And yes, that can work with RPGs, even JRPGs. But there also wasn't consistent characters that you kept coming back to repeatedly that really grounded you in the world. It just... something didn't work here. And frankly, I think it's just because of the structure of the game. I mean, you can only adjust a skeleton so much, the skeleton is bones, and those bones, you can't bend them, well, at least too much. 
Overall though, when you look at the price of the game, when you look at the fact that, well, just take a look at how many hours I put in the game, even if a third of it was the game being left idle, and the replayability of using different skills and loadouts, Osteoblast is something that I would highly recommend to any sort of player who loves the mechanics of JRPGs. Remember, my base objective scoring system is a buyability rating here, and considering the low price of entry and the great combat system that I kept coming back to, even if the game doesn't necessarily compare to Virgo vs. the Zodiac in the overall picture, or games like Persona 5 or other JRPGs, this is definitely a game that you get a bang for buck on. The story does suffer, and it won't exactly keep you entertained in the main storyline, but all the underlying good writing and quirks of the presentation will endear the game to you. That's why I give the game an 85 out of 100, making it a solid buy unless you're hurting for cash. But that doesn't include my enhancer system. Like I said, my main score is an objective score. It takes out the more subjective elements and puts them into enhancers, which are listed here. If you fall strongly into one of these following categories, add or subtract that score to the main score. If the first digit of your score changes, then refer to this chart to see where the game lies on the buyability rating for you. And as you can see here, yeah, this game has a lot of enhancers. In fact, maybe more than I've ever had, I really haven't checked. It isn't going to be a game for everyone, but it has enough strengths in certain areas that it does have a good audience in terms of being able to reach different areas and different elements of the whole player base. So take a look and see if it's right for you. Anyway, thank you for watching this review if you've gotten this far. And of course, if you like the video, you know, hit that like, the subscribe button, and all that jazz. I'm not going to beg, however. I will beg, however, to put comments in the comment section below on how I can improve this review in this particular style, or what you liked about the review. Or heck, even a game that you do want me to review that's upcoming. The next video will probably be a first impressions on Good Night Night, but I'm always reviewing in terms of, well, giving feedback on games over on Twitch for indie investigation streams two to three times a week. So go see me there. But for now, this is Dragdick signing out, and as always, keep on gaming.